for inviting me to speak today. Um, Dr. Lakshmi Mehta and I um, are very happy to be here today with you. Um, for us, it's 1.30, and um, so it's not hard for us to be here, but um, thank you all for um, joining us today. Um, what I'd like to, can you all see my screen? Yes, uh, we can see your screen. Okay, good, thank you so much. So okay. I was asked to speak about the connection of uh, COVID-19 and cardiovascular disease. I know there are a lot of issues for women and um, COVID-19, and uh, I think some of our panelists and speakers will address those issues. But for my talk, I will just talk about specifically cardiovascular disease and COVID-19. Um, this is a picture of my colleague at Rush Heart Center for Women. As you can see, we're a very diverse group of women and, um, and men that um, take care of patients in Chicago area. And we've seen a fair share of our COVID patients. So we're dealing with COVID-19 in, in a big way at Rush University Medical Center because we, um, the hospital was built for COVID-19 and pandemic. So we are taking care of over um, uh, several uh, thousands of patients already. Um, uh, we usually have over 200 patients at one time in our hospital um, system. So we uh, do take care of a lot of patients. Dr. Lakshmi Mehta and I um, thought of this uh, review paper and we wrote a scientific statement about South Asians and the risk of cardiovascular disease in the United States. But as you know, um, cardiovascular disease affects a lot of South Asians throughout the world. And the South Asians that we're speaking about are definitely the, the ones in Pakistan. So I'm gonna concentrate on um, the Pakistan uh, cardiovascular disease and COVID-19. As you know, um, there are a lot of comorbidities that affect cardiovascular disease and the risk of COVID-19 mortality. So we're gonna speak about that. This is a um, global um, disease. It's a global pandemic. And as you can see, the dark red are the ones that are affected the most. Uh, it started in China and then spread to um, Europe. So Italy has been very much affected. And I'm gonna compare the Pakistan people to the Italian people, and you can see the differences. But America, the United States has the most people affected by COVID. And since it's a big population, um, we are seeing a lot of that. So COVID-19 intersects with cardiovascular disease. And we're going to specifically um, concentrate on women and sex differences in this um, problem. This is an interesting website that um, collects um, sex disaggregated data. So it's a global health 5050, and the website is here. I just um, updated this, and as you can see, Thailand has the highest male to female ratio in terms of death mortality ratio. But you have to be careful in interpreting this data because this is a very small number of, pay, of deaths. So I don't want to uh, make it seem like there are so many more men dying of, heart, of COVID-19, um, but I want to concentrate on the two countries here in the bottom. Interestingly, most countries have a higher male to female death ratio but not the case in India and Pakistan. And I don't um, have the India um, numbers here because they don't have the complete sex disaggregated data yet, but Pakistan has a, a male to female ratio that is less than one. So I wanna make sure that people understand what this means. In terms of deaths, there have been about 727 deaths as of um, the uh, collection of this data compared to 27,000 deaths in Italy. And if you look at the deaths in terms of percent males and percent females, there are definitely a lot more men who are dying from um, COVID-19 compared to women. But if you look at the deaths um, in confirmed ratios among the men, the 
there's a 2.1% in Pakistan versus 2.3 in women. So there is a um, more women who get COVID-19 who die from it than men who get COVID-19 who die from it. And that's why there's a, a ratio of less than one. But if you look at the Italian data, you can see that there's a, a much higher death mortality um, rate in, in Italy compared to, to Pakistan. And it's much higher in men than in women. And that's why they have an almost uh, two to one ratio of men dying from um, COVID-19 to women dying from COVID-19. And this is a, a chart specifically from Italy and from Pakistan. As you can see in, in Italy, there is a skewed um, ratio of, of men and women. So the men are in the blue and um, the women are in, in the orange. There are a lot um, more older people getting, the, getting COVID-19 and in terms of deaths over here to the right, there are more men dying of COVID-19 than women, even though more women get COVID-19. In Pakistan, it's actually very different. You see the ratio, the distribution is a more of a bell-shaped curve. So there are a lot of men and women, a lot more men than women having COVID-19 cases, but the deaths go up as the, the men get older. So there are definitely a lot more men dying of COVID-19, but when women get COVID-19, their risk is slightly higher than the men. So very interesting. So there are sex differences in mortality from COVID-19. And uh, Dr. Sharma and Dr. Mikos and I wrote this paper that was just published. So we're seeing this mortality case ratio that is higher for men in most countries. And we attributed this to maybe the higher um, risk of ischemic heart disease in men. The lifestyles are different in men, especially in Italy. They, um, they have more smoking, they have more alcohol use um, in the men, but women have a higher immune response than men. So that might be playing a role as well. And we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna talk mostly about ACE2 receptors because that is the way um, COVID-19, uh, the coronavirus gets into the cells. This is a recent study that showed that there are sex differences in the response, in the immune response to COVID-19 in terms of IgG antibody level. So even though there were more, um, uh, there, I'm just gonna show you in terms of the IgG response, you can see here that in terms of men to female ratio, it's similar if you have mild case or in general, but if you have a severe case of COVID-19, the women mount a higher IgG response compared to the males. And um, they're about the same in the recovered patients. So in the severe cases of COVID-19, the women have a higher immune response. So that's one difference that we're seeing. In terms of um, COVID-19 and cardiovascular disease, there is a higher, um, a higher risk of heart failure and acute cardiovascular injury in the patients who die of um, COVID-19. So cardiovascular disease is definitely a risk factor in when, when people get COVID-19. So I'm gonna talk mostly about um, the coronavirus and the interaction of it with um, ACE2 receptors. As you can see here, this is the virus. And in order for the virus to get into the cell, to to kill the cell and to replicate um, is by using the ACE2 receptor. So ACE2 receptors are very important in uh, the um, COVID-19 disease. And another sex difference that we can see is in the ACE2 expression in the human organs. As you can see here, the small intestine have the most ACE2 um, expression in the organs, followed only by the testes, second only to um, the intestines. So the testicles definitely have a higher ACE2 receptors than the ovary and the fallopian tube in the vaginal cell. So very interesting. 
here is the heart muscle. So they definitely have ACE2 receptors. Um, and the lungs are way down here, but it seems to be affecting the lung tissue in a very big way. And that remains to be um, explained. So there was a question of whether ACE inhibitors and ACE2 and ACE um, angiotensin receptor blockers and other renin angiotensin aldosterone system blockers would increase the mortality or the morbidity of patients who are, who are on ACE inhibitors. And there was a worry that our patients, and they were calling us to see if, um, I somehow lost my, <laughs> Let me get back to my Zoom. Um, there was a worry among our patients whether um, they would not fare as well if they um, were on ACE or ARBs. And so until um, some of the studies reported that there was no risk, um, we were really, we didn't really know the answer. I think that people are much um, nine hospitals in Hubei province, which is where um, Wuhan is. And just to, um, um, to shortcut, um, we want to, uh, I wanted to show you that there were 188 patients among the, the patients who were studied uh, in the 3,000 patients who were studied. There were 188 patients who were an ACE or ARB, and there were 522 who were not an ACE or ARB. And so they did a propensity score match um, study. And what they found was in the adjusted, um, adjusted hazard ratio, there were definitely less deaths in the patients who were in ACE or ARBs. So this was very comforting um, for, um, for our patients who were on ACE or ARBs. Another study that was just done in New York that was done by Dr. Harmony Reynolds and Dr. Hockman from NYU looked at their um, population and they uh, looked at 12,000 patients who tested uh, for COVID. And among their patients who had um, hypertension, they found no substantial increase in getting COVID or getting worse outcomes from um, being on the um, ACE or ARBs compared to the other classes of um, antihypertensive drugs. Another study that looked at ACE and ARBs um, in a hy hypertensive patients showed that there was no significant difference among the women and men who got COVID, who had hypertension. But what they did find was that there was significantly lower um, concentrations of HSCRP and procalcitonin in the patients who were on ACE or ARBs compared to those who were not. Um, even though there was no um, significant difference in the critical patients or mortality, it was interesting to find that the ACE and ARBs decreased inflammation in these patients. So very interesting. This is just to show you um, that the um, ACE2 receptors that I was talking about for the virus to get into the cell is just one kind of ACE2 receptors there seems to be soluble ACE2 receptors that are also present in the plasma that do bind to the coronavirus. And these will just be cleared away by the immune system. So if you have a lot of IgG that can clear this um, ACE2 receptors binding to the coronavirus, it may be the reason why women are getting um, less mortality than the men. So interestingly, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, the, all the major cardiovascular societies recommended stopping, not stopping the ACE or ARBs in patients with other, uh, and other um, RAS medications in uh, patients who were taking them. So they made the right call by telling patients not to stop those ACE inhibitors and ARBs if they had hypertension. 
Another interesting study that literally just came out today, and I wanted to show you was the, the study that looked at the characteristics of outcomes of patients hospitalized with COVID-19. And what they found was that um, definitely cardiac disease is a risk factor for mortality in patients who, um, who have COVID. Um, they found that patients um, with uh, cardiovascular disease had an increased risk of um, death. Um, as you can see in this red, um, this is patients with cardiac disease. They have more deaths. They also have more ARDS. Um, which is acute respiratory distress syndrome, acute um, venous thromboembolic disease, arterial thromboembolic disease, and more septic shock. So very interesting. And they found that um, patients who had cardiac troponin that was elevated, that was a prognostic biomarker in patients who were admitted for COVID-19. So we are learning there are, I think, I think there are more questions than answers, but we are starting to get some answers. And in, with the rapidity of the uh, publications of so many studies on COVID-19, if you can believe it, since December uh, 2019 and until today, there have been 12,000 papers published in PubMed regarding COVID-19. So very interesting. I wrote this um, op-ed because what we were finding is that all of a sudden with the COVID pandemic, there were less people presenting with heart attacks and strokes. And we were seeing that people were not coming into the hospital. And this is worrisome for us because we know that heart disease and strokes have not gone away. We just are not seeing those patients present to the hospital. So even though COVID-19, this is, I got this from the AHA um, that have been trying, that has been trying to tell people, don't worry about coming into the hospital because if you're having a stroke or heart attack, you need to come into the hospital to get, um, to get care because you could die from strokes and heart attacks. So even though COVID-19 has changed a lot, the bottom line of strokes and heart attacks have not changed. And they are pleading people to call 911 if they have these symptoms because it's still the best chance to live. So thank you so much for your attention. And I um, would like to um, uh, end here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wolfman. This talk was excellent and very relevant to the current pandemic. Uh, we would like to tell all the participants that the questions will be right at the end. So we would mo move on to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Anida Sadekhpur. She would talk about stigma prevention and psychological perspectives. So over to you, Dr. Sadekhpur. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Nita. Yeah. So, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be part of this great webinar. Thanks for the invitation. I just want to make a correction that I'm professor of cardiology from Rajoy Heart Center. This is my first affiliation from Iran, Tehran, and also I'm in, now in Duke. I'm going to talk about the definition and ideology of a stigma in COVID-19 pandemic the impact of the stigma in people and communities, and also people who are at risk for stigmatization, negative impacts of COVID-19 on women, how we can prevent and reduce the stigma. Stigma and discrimination is common in disease outbreaks, even in can be more dangerous than the disease itself. And in COVID-19 pandemic, stigmatization means people are labeled a stereotype, or discriminated because some other people believe those population or even nationality are greater risk for spreading COVID-19, even though not everyone in that population is specifically at risk for this disease. So COVID-19 pandemic is stressful. We know it's stressful for all people around the world. But why the COVID-19 causing stigma? 
COVID-19 pandemic is new disease with many unknowns and misinformation, which can create fear and even blaming anyone who have been in contact with the virus or people from a certain geographic region. Stigmatized people may suffer psychologically and economically. And the stigma hurts everyone and may result in more severe health problems and difficulties in controlling the outbreak. These people may be subjected for social rejection, facing difficulties in accessing education, housing, finding jobs, and even may be targets for verbal, emotional, and physical abuse. So people will try to hide the illness or even choose not to be tested to avoid being labeled as corona positive patients. People who are at risk for its stigmatization are, person, are persons of Asian descent, people returning from travel, healthcare workers, emergency responders, people with disease and their family and friends, people released from quarantine. The COVID-19 pandemic affects everyone, although it has more negative impact in women. Female healthcare workers, unfortunately, they face a double burden, one at work and one at home. In the workplace, women are less paid and less likely to be in management position. They also are at risk for stigmatization due to caring for COVID-19 patients. How to stop or prevent or reduce social stigma? Indeed, everyone can help to stop by knowing the facts and sharing them in the community. Everyone should be cautious about the negative impact of certain words and images that are shared. The words matter. The words are important. Do not attach the ethnicity or location to the virus. It is not Chinese, Wuhan, or Asian virus. It is coronavirus disease 2019. That's why it is called COVID-19. We have to say people who have COVID-19, not the people or COVID-19 cases or COVID-19 suspects. And more importantly, maintain privacy and confidentiality of those who are seeking for the healthcare. Governments, communities, public health, official and media have an important role in preventing and stopping stigma. By spreading the facts about the transmission, treatment and prevention of COVID-19, they can amplify the voices, engage with a stigmatized group in person and through social media and news. They can show compassion and support for individuals and communities. And what, one, what we can do as individuals by speaking up, if we hear or see a stigmatization or misinformation, show compassion and support for individuals and communities more closely impacted by avoiding stigmatizing people who are in quarantine. We can thank healthcare workers, responders, and others who are caring for people with COVID-19 and even calling them COVID-19 heroes. Share positive messages in social media. And we know that research has shown that 70% of workers in the health and social sector are women, and they need the appreciation and support. Stigma can damage the mental health and well-being of a stigmatized group. These are the ways to cope with the stress. Take break what, from watching, reading, listening to the pandemic news. Those are going to be overwhelmed and upsetting. By taking care of your body, having a, a stretch meditation and eating well, sleeping well, exercise, and even doing something that is joy enjoyable. We can be creative even at work. These are images that my colleagues shared at the, at the society's scientific group and social media. 
by finding something which is easy to have additional protection, such as these protection that is easily made and it has been shown that can be, can be effective when there is a shortage of the PPE. Although everyone has to follow the standard personal protective equipment, adding these, these protective shield can be very helpful and even reduce the exposure to the virus. So in summary, in COVID-19 pandemic, social stigma is common. Sometimes the stigma of COVID-19 is more dangerous than the disease. Everyone can prevent social stigma by choosing appropriate words and spreading valid information. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sadekhur. This was a very relevant talk, especially for mental health awareness. Uh, we would now like to invite Dr. Mehta for her presentation on COVID-19 and healthcare burnout. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes, Ms. Lakshmi. Wonderful. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak on behalf of the American Heart Association, and we're pleased with our partnership with the Pakistani um, Cardiac Society. Burnout in healthcare has been on the rise over the last several decades, much before even COVID-19 was known as an entity and was largely due to systemic issues. But with COVID-19, there are also resiliency issues that have become important as well. Burnout can mean a lot of different things to people, but it's often defined as depersonalization, emotional exhaustion, and reduced personal accomplishment in a perceived stressful environment. Recognizing burnout can be difficult, and sometimes we're too busy to ever stop and think about where we fall on the stress curve. So if you look at the figure on the right, uh, with stress levels on the x-axis and performance on the y-axis on the left, their low stress levels and low performance is uh, associated with inactivity. And as stress levels increase, your performance increases, but eventually you get to a tipping point of increasing stress levels where many people are now with COVID-19, which can lead to exhaustion, anxiety, panic, breakdown, and uh, burnout. So there are repercussions of uh, phys physician burnout and their personal and professional repercussions. The professional repercussions include decreased quality of care, decreased productivity and increased physician toner, turnover, which can be quite costly for physicians as well as institutions. There are personal ramifications that also need to be considered, including broken relationships, substance abuse, alcohol abuse, uh, depression, and a suicide. Additionally, many of us honored being in the field of medicine, but what we recognize is that almost 60% of physicians now wouldn't recommend a career in medicine to their children uh, with the uh, incidence of burnout. And this is pre-COVID-19 uh, statements, so it can only be much worse at the, at the present time. ACC survey data from 2015 showed that more than one quarter of US cardiologists and fellows in training were burnt out and less than one quarter were not uh, burned out and not highly stressed. So they actually were enjoying their job. Uh, so very alarming numbers. Uh, what we saw in these pre-COVID data was that the highest level of burnout was amongst mid-career cardiologists and women. But with COVID-19, the increased stress um, is not only with healthcare workers, but essential workers. Women make up about 53% of essential workers in the US and women make up nearly nine out of 10 nurses and nursing assistants, most respiratory therapists, and a majority of, of pharmacists and pharmacy aides and technicians. Um, in addition, there are also many female physicians that also compromise this essential workforce. Um, more than two thirds of workers at grocery stores and checkouts, fast food counters are also women, placing women across the globe at uh, the highest risk. And despite these highest percentages among women, uh, women tend to spend the most amount of time directly with sick patients, putting them at an even higher risk of burnout. So the increased burden with lack of knowledge about the virus, lack of resources, concerns of transmission, and lack of adequate treatment, along with ethical issues regarding resource allocation, 
and the fear of the unknown are some of the contributors to increased psychological stress. This is not an issue just of short-term consequences um, and that it'll go away once the peak resolves. But we need to know that the increased psychological stress that is associated with COVID-19 can lead to increased heart rates, increased blood pressure, endothelial dysfunction, atherosclerosis, which we have seen in other stress-related uh, um, uh, findings, uh, which all can contribute to long-term development of cardiovascular disease. So COVID-19 is not something that'll be here just with the peak or shortly after the peak, but we'll see many, many more years of uh, damage and many more research um, articles that are put out there like Dr. Boldman had mentioned earlier. So as women physicians and nurses, we have much exposure to the sickest and along with the stretches, we also have other burdens, including household duties. With social distancing, all cooking and cleaning services have limited outside help at this time. And children are at home and some require babysitting needs as well as school needs. So parents are on double duty. They now are taking on teacher roles and have no break when they go home. And some are even separating themselves from their family with social distancing for fear of spreading the virus to their loved ones. This all increases our stress levels. This survey um, looked at 675 general practitioners in the UK and uh, uh, kind of assessed their uh, stress levels. And they asked them about uh, PPE. And in, in this survey, about 74% feared for their health or their life. 52% felt unsafe due to the lack of PPE. And only 33% actually felt they had adequate supply of uh, face masks. And 26% um, have seen patients without personal protective uh, equipment, um, which is uh, high. And, and I would say that uh, many uh, people across the globe have, uh, probably would report even higher numbers um, in the early days. So switching from the UK data to the US data, among 315,000 uh, people or with COVID-19 reported to the CDC during February to April data, um, you can see that, um, that uh, in this figure on the left, yeah, these are the cases. In light is the non health night light blue is the non healthcare personnel, and then darker blue is the percent of people or number of cases of healthcare personnel. So there's a starkingly high level of healthcare professionals who uh, are developing uh, or uh, obtaining uh, COVID 19. Um, in the 9,000 plus U US COVID cases amongst healthcare professionals, the median age was 42. Um, and 73% were female. Uh, people reported contact with COVID-19. Majority were in the healthcare setting, but uh, there's, they're also contracting it at in the household and in the community settings. Although these numbers of healthcare professionals are high, most of them were not hospitalized. However, so severe outcomes, including death, were reported in all ages amongst healthcare professionals. Given the large numbers of women at risk, there's a need for gender analysis into preparedness and response efforts to improve the effectiveness of health interventions and promote gender and health equity goals. For example, during the 2014-2016 West African outbreak of Ebola virus disease, women were more likely to be infected by the virus, but less likely to have power in decision-making around their outbreak and their needs were largely unmet. For example, resources for reproductive and sexual health during Ebola were diverted to an emergency response, contributing to an ever rising uh, increase in maternal mortality in a region where one of the highest rates is in the world. And in the US, um, that's a concern too, because maternal mortality is highest due to cardiovascular disease. And as resources are shifted away from other women's health um, uh, issues, that can be problematic. So it's important for governments and global health institutions to consider the sex and gender effects of COVID-19 outbreak, both direct gender effects as well as indirect effects and conduct an analysis of the gendered impacts of the multiple outbreaks, incorporating the voices of women on the front line of the response to COVID-19 and of those most affected by the disease with preparedness and response policies or practices going forward. So what do health care professionals request from their organizations? They have five key respects. Hear me, protect me, prepare me, support me, and care for me. 
So one, hear me, listen to and act on healthcare professional expert perspectives. This can be accomplished with an array of input and feedback channels, including uh, involving healthcare professionals in decision-making uh, processes. Number two, protect me, reduce the risk of healthcare professionals acquiring the infection or being in a portal of transmission to uh, family members. So not only is it including adequate PPE, but access to um, testing if they're concerned that they may have contracted COVID-19 and necessary accommodations, uh, housing accommodations. Three, prepare me, provide the training and support that allows the provision of high quality of care. It includes rapid critical knowledge training like ventilator management. And that's why the Pakistan uh, Cardiac Society has uh, formulated webinars like this to help prepare uh, not only the Pakistani people, but globally, as you can see, there's many numbers of people that have joined this chat box across the globe. Number four, support me. Provide support that acknowledges human limitations in times of extreme work hours and intense exposure to critically ill patients, including the access to healthy meals and hydration. We're hearing from frontline workers that there's not time to take, uh, eat a meal or to uh, drink water even. Um, and uh, for the fear of uh, self-contaminating themselves while they're trying to take care of their basic needs. Um, Number five, care for me. Provide holistic support for the individual and their family should they need should the need be for quarantine, including lodging of healthcare professionals if they're concerned that they may have contracted and don't want to spread to their family members, as well as child care is essential and the emotional support is highly needed. So what are strategies for clinicians as well? So not only those things that they need to ask their organizations, but these are things of making sure you meet your basic needs, making sure you're taking time out to eat, drink, sleep, and uh, exercise regularly. Um, taking breaks is essential. Taking breaks from patient care, walking, listening to music, writing a journal, whatever activities um, inspire you um, to, to do more for yourself. Number three is stay connected. So um, give and receive support from your colleagues to avoid isolation, fear, and anxiety. Remember, social isolation doesn't, uh, sorry, social distancing does not mean social isolation and that you can reach out across to friends uh, within your own community and across the globe. And four is to respect differences. Recognize and respect the differences in yourself, your patients, and your colleagues and uh, need to understand where they're coming from. Number five is staying updated and um, using uh, trusted resources of information. Um, sometimes social media can provide the greatest of information and sometimes the worst of information. So being cognizant of that is important. Uh, number six, perform self check-ins. Monitor for your, yourself for any symptoms um, is, is essential. And you know, one of the things that's out there across the globe is the need to flatten the curve. And, and many societies have been really good about uh, making a difference and flattening the curves in terms of healthcare and not overburdening the healthcare system. But we also need to know that it's not just flattening the infection curve, but we also need to flatten the mental health curve and making sure that we're doing the primary prevention of taking care of ourselves and those around us in these important needs of time. So I'm pleased to remember that uh, when you used to travel on airplanes, you used to hear the safety announcements uh, before takeoff that in a case of an emergency, put your own oxygen mask on before helping others. We would say the same of COVID-19, not only putting on your own PPE mask, but in order to take care of others, we need to remember to take care of ourselves too. And finally, if you feel burned out or highly stressed, do seek attention either from your institute's employee assistance program, your national suicide prevention line, or your colleagues. Thank you, be safe, and namaste. Thank you, Dr. Mehta. Uh, so I think this talk was very appropriate in the sense because a lot of healthcare professionals these days, especially those who are frontline in treating COVID patients, have experienced some form of a burnout lately. So this talk, I think, has been very useful in that sense. So um, I would like, now like to move to our panel of uh, co-chairs. We have some exceptional and accomplished women who are co-chairs for today's webinar. And we would like to ask their expert opinion on some of the questions that we have for them. So first, um, we would like to go to Dr. Jenna. And we have a question for her, Dr. Jenna. Yes, Anena, here. Yes. Okay, so um, we have a question for you and we would like to hear your expert opinion on this. 
So are there any gender differences in cardiovascular diseases that may play a role in protecting women from severe COVID-19 infection? Uh, Hunea, thank you for that question. I think um, a fair bit of that was answered by Annabelle's uh, talk earlier uh, very nicely. Uh, but I think I'll repeat a few points uh, because repetition never hurts. Uh, uh, so I think, uh, you know, we, we all know that the case fatality ratios for men are higher, uh, although there are some countries where that, um, that is not seen. But there may be some, several factors that may be at play as to why we see uh, more men dying of COVID um, than women. And firstly, it has to do with the risk factor prevalence. So men often have a higher prevalence of hypertension, diabetes, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is associated with more severe COVID and death. Um, and so that is one thing that actually uh, works against men and, and more along uh, being protective for women. Um, secondly, estrogen is thought to be a protective uh, hormone. Um, there's some mice model data from the SARS-CoV um, uh, virus times that suggests that when male mice were infected um, with SARS-CoV, they, they had um, gonadectomy, but there was no difference in outcomes for the SARS-CoV uh, or uh, infection. But when female mice underwent ophorectomy, they found that uh, they had more severe disease and died from that disease, uh, which suggests that there is some effect of hormones um, as far as severe COVID uh, infection is concerned. Um, and, and that's something that's under investigation and in trials right now. Um, and thirdly, this is something that Annabelle mentioned in her talk too. It has to do with the immune response. So women um, we know have stronger and more adaptive immune responses than men. So they're able to get hold of the virus and get, get, get rid of the virus much quicker. Um, in immunization studies, we know that they mount a more stronger immune response. And just because of the fact that uh, they're able to get pregnant, um, there is the adaptive immunity aspect of it that must be considered, uh, which we find you know, uh, that in COVID, there's um, most of the severe COVID infection has to do with uh, a haywire, an immune response that's going haywire towards uh, the later phases, or later days. So that's something, these are the three things that might be protective um, for women. Now in situations where we're seeing um, the case fatality ratio being almost equivalent, it may really have to do with, uh, with societies or countries where um, women's healthcare seeking behavior and the access to care may be different uh, than it is for men. And, and that we know for several other diseases, especially in the countries that uh, Annabelle mentioned, both in India and Pakistan, uh, the healthcare seeking behavior and access for women is very different. Uh, uh, so, so that's something that I think probably plays a role um, as far as uh, case fatality ratios is concerned. Thank you, Dr. Samad. That was an exceptional answer. Um, so uh, would you think that this access to healthcare might uh, influence the numbers of women that are uh, getting diagnosed with COVID-19? Most likely, yes. I think um, um, the infection rates have been associated with gender, um, knowing that occupational exposure might uh, put more men at risk. Then again, um, household clustering, where you would expect that that transmission would still happen to the female household members, but then men get tested and diagnosed more. So I think that is definitely at play. And unless we do studies, um, rigorous studies, looking at prevalence of this disease, uh, we're not really going to get at the root, uh, the, the true picture uh, as far as gender difference is concerned. Okay. Thank you so much for this answer. Uh, we would now like to move to Dr. Amber Malik. Dr. Amber, are you with us? Yes. Okay. So uh, my question to you is uh, what impact this COVID-19 lockdown might have had on women seeking healthcare for urgent cardiac issues? Do you think they're more prone to having complications if they're not having access to healthcare these days? Um, uh, thank you for your question. I'd, uh, first of all, I'd like 
congratulate all the three speakers for an excellent collection of talks and I think uh, very relevant. Uh, uh, I learned a lot and we put together a lot of things that are going on and everybody had reading and, uh, and this is all that we do. We talk about uh, uh, read up on it. So it's very nice to think perspective and, uh, and look at it from the women's point of view. I think the question is essentially the, what's happening in the lockdown uh, with women uh, in healthcare. And uh, we, uh, let me talk about it from a funny perspective that we are now in the second month, uh, at the end of the second month of our lockdown essentially. So, you know, people have been sitting at home since March. And, uh, uh, and I think what is happening in the rest of the world, as well as in Pakistan, is that everybody's getting fed up. We've talked about mental issues, and I can see that happening around us. But what we noticed in our hospitals, at least particularly for Lahore, let me tell you, that as we went on to build 1,000 bedded expo center for uh, infectious diseases and to quarantine and isolate and put up COVID patients, what we got here was that a lot of our hospitals actually became empty and all our clinics, people just didn't show up. And, uh, and, and I can tell you about cardiovascular disease, our ERs, we were not receiving the number of STEMI that we were expecting and uh, that we get all the time. And I, I don't know about Zainab uh, in Karachi and everyone, but we did hear that, uh, and if you ask from other people, interventional labs, their work went down by one third, uh, uh, essentially. And, and our clinics here, uh, they, they, they're, they're just empty. We did stop doing any kind of elective patients even. So the message went across to patients that they are not welcome maybe, or, and they themselves were afraid. And again, there's the stigma, the fear of coming to hospital or going to doctors that you will get the disease. So people hide their disease. So who is the person who bears the brunt of it most of all? It is women, particularly in our country, because they play down uh, uh, their, uh, their problems. Other people have bigger problems than them. And, and, and so the gender comes in uh, over there. And, uh, and so I think that's, uh, uh, that's what has happened. And there are a lot of articles now that what happened to all the cardiac patients in the, in, in the epidemic. And uh, it seems that either they have stayed at home because it's not possible that they are not getting sick, but either they've stayed at home and they have suffered the disease and they will come back to us now. They are stacking up somewhere and they will start coming back in. Also, there's Ramzan going on at the moment here also. So that's when things go down as well. What I do have, a lot of patients uh, are, are looking for help. A lot of them are getting their hypertension out of control because they haven't seen anybody for the last two months, particularly women, uh, some of the women, some women living alone and even women who are living with people because they don't know what to do, where to go. A lot of their doctors are not in contact, are not in touch. So there's a lot of chaos and a lot of worries about patients. Uh, they, uh, they want to see uh, doctors physically, but they're afraid to go and meet them. So I think it has made a lot of impact and we will see the fallout very soon when things become a little bit more streamlined. We are encouraging people to come on telemed. That has to be with people who are more tech savvy and, and people are tech savvy, but it will take a while for them to catch on that they can have access to healthcare even without having physical contact, which is the stigma as well as the fear factor. Uh, uh, that is uh, uh, causing them problems. So I, th I think a lot of hypertension is out of control uh, uh, amongst women hanging around over there, and uh, and, and 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 the routine work uh, and the routine problems like heart failure, acute coronary syndromes, they suppress somehow or the other, and somewhere they're hidden, and I'm sure they're going to crop up pretty soon. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Doctor Number. Um, it's definitely the same over here in Karachi as well. We have also seen a drop in the volume of our STEMI patients, but slowly they're picking up. Um, but yes, your answer was very relevant and thank you so much. Thank you. So um, next I would like to invite Dr. Khalda Sumru. So we have a question for her. Dr. Khalda, are you with us? Yes, Dr. Dr. Khalda, I have unmuted you. Dr. Khalda, 
can can you hear me yes yes, yes. okay i want Dr. to Hada? i want to say thanks to my foreign speakers who uh, spent their time to be with us on this occasion and they uh, this is their uh, their uh, i mean uh, this is their time which is which matters for us regarding your question Yes. Mm. Yes. So the question I, we have for you is: uh, We know that cardiovascular disease is very pre fairly prevalent among pregnant women in Pakistan, and it is the leading cause of death in pregnant women amongst uh, the pregnant women in the United States. So, is there a need for any specific guidelines in the management of pregnant patients who have COVID-19 infection in terms of risk medication for cardiac injury? You see, if we we are talking about the uh, pregnant ladies in younger age group, especially when uh, you, women are in the productive age, they are more younger than the 50 years of age. We know that the risk increases after the age of 50, up to 50 years, 2.4. 2.4 is the risk for uh, mortality in uh, women and men. So our pregnant women are uh, comparatively uh, younger than that age group, and they they have the same risk of non-pregnant women. And if we are talking about the comorbid conditions, comorbid conditions, congenital heart diseases, ischemic heart diseases can be present in these patients along with the diabetes. So. In that case, mortality usually is more than the their same age group, and they will have to be careful and they, uh, for that group. If we are talking about the first trimester, you see, there is usually the flu-like symptoms and mild symptoms in these patients if they are, don't have so many comorbid conditions, and. These uh, patients usually can be followed and can be isolated at home with the medical advice taken from the, their GPs and consultants. Later on, if the after the age of uh, after 32 weeks of the uh, pregnancy, risk increases in these patients because of the volume overload, infections, and because of other things. So. They, there are more chances of uh, complications in that group. And they, uh, as far as baby, with, uh, baby is concerned, in early, uh, pre, uh, first trimester, early abortions, ectopic pregnancies, and other infectious diseases can lead to the uh, problem in the premature uh, baby. But in the late, after 32 weeks of the pregnancy, usually these patients have uh, certainly uh, can be isolated and can be uh, can be can be having other prevention measures, which are common for the other guide other people. Guidelines are the same up till the pregnancy or uh, delivery time. So that period, our patients can have the uh, same guidelines, can follow the, uh, the same guidelines, but they can limit the, their uh, meeting with the doctors and they, uh, that is important, I think, because to, to go to hospital uh, will be dangerous for them. And they are, uh, as far as the risk during the pregnancy is concerned, baby will not have infected from the uh, 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 coronavirus by vaginal delivery. You see, by vaginal delivery, baby will not be infected even after the delivery. Baby will have safe breast feeding from the mother. There is no impact on the breast uh, breastfeeding. So, if we 
think about the guidelines uh, yes in the third trimester but they almost they are same if we are considering the c section these are same for the elective these are same for the elective surgery yes delivery um, as i have already told that uh, vaginal delivery can be uh, performed premature uh, delivery before the uh, c section before the time even in certain those conditions in which there uh, there is uh, mother is uh, will have relief from the symptoms and baby will be safely uh, delivered that will be a, a indication for the c section in the uh, last uh, term of the pregnancy anyways guidelines mo mostly depends upon as other uh, women suffering from the corona virus and elective surgery so there may be a need but the mortality is mostly due to the comorbid condition increased co co uh, comorbid conditions and congenital diseases okay thank you thank you dr khalda hmm. so next we would like to ask dr nusrat majid ye to usko bolo ko dr nusrat majid is it okay dr nusrat can you yes okay so assalamu alaikum uh, dr nusrat i have a question uh, we know that the quarantine and the lockdown have a lot of psychological effects on the people um, what mental health tips would you give especially to women with cardiovascular disease to counter this psychological impact and do you think women in cardiology can maybe partner with psychologists and psychiatrists and in this new health order to help this mental health issue yeah thank you as you can see i am half asleep but anyway it was an important uh, issue and i decided to participate and thank you so much for invitation so bismillahir rahmanir rahim in the name of god the most merciful today my lord we pray for a miraculous healing and an end to this covid curse that has fallen upon us um as we know we never heard this word lock up curfew and quarantine till 5th august 2019 and my heart bleeds to speak about it when the greatest human calamity was imposed on the people of kashmir especially women and children i would leave it here but it's very sad that the entire world kept quiet and then there was divine justice and god said okay let me put the entire world in lockdown mm -hmm. so coming back to your question about the negative psychological impact mm -hmm. i think besides negative it has a positive psychological impact also maybe you don't have time that look at the ozone layer it is clearing up and people are spending more time with their loved ones their children parents they have time for self reflection and connection to god and all those positive things regarding tips for mental health a lot has been said but i would just like to enumerate a few things number one it is very important to have a routine it doesn't mean that if you are not going to work you should behave like an animal get up whenever you want to eat whatever you feel like no the life has to be disciplined this is the basic characteristics of a human being then you heard and every i think people should stay away from screen and social media if you are glued to tv and social media this definitely is going to have negative impact and you may not be very comfortable yes once in a while not once in a while twice thrice it is very important to be aware of what is going on and especially on tv and some of the social media you are getting some useful tips regarding prevention and how to keep ourselves safe from this deadly infection 
then you've heard about uh, people talking of role of diet and exercise, role of vitamin C, D, et cetera, minerals and all that. People are talking about yoga and meditation. And here I will go back to the basics. 1400 years ago, when we were asked to pray five times a day, and especially in this holy month of Ramadan, maybe we are praying seven, eight, 10 times a day. And can you see the beauty? Just by praying, we combine all three in that. We are exercising. This is an excellent form of exercising different parts of the body. And yoga, again, when we offer our prayers, we have to be in different poses. We bend, we bow, and all that. And third, meditation, because we are standing in front of God, and we have to be fully attentive. And then we get rid of all the worries and other nasty things around us. So this was diet and that. And then you also remember that 1400 years ago, the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that in case of epidemic, don't go to that place, nor do you leave that. And this perhaps is the modern version of your lockdown phenomenon. So then I will not, the speakers have very nicely elaborated upon uh, uh, prevention against a psychological impact, I would like to uh, touch upon a different uh, aspect of that. Regarding diet, you talk about vegetable fruits and all that. Remember in the holy book, three things have been mentioned and that is not without any significance. Number one, your dates, olives and figs. And then lately, people are talking a lot about black seed Kalonji in our language, like Chilia, I don't know what many medicines are being, this is the potent anti-inflammatory and antioxidant. And lately, a herb which is called sumac. I wonder if any one of you is aware of that. It spells like S-U-M-A-C. These are small dried berries and believe me, they have a miraculous effect. I have given it to some of my patients, again, elderly ladies with heart disease, and then the complaints of palpitation and fainting and all that. Most of the time they were on telephone with me and they are doing wonderfully well. And then honey, of course, you know, it has medicinal properties, figs. And then a very important thing and which has worked wonders at night, if you instill one or two drops of extra virgin olive oil in both the nostrils, you try that. At the moment it gets down to the throat, you have a very nice plus little um, uh, unpleasant type of feeling and you get to know that something has entered into your system and it is about to act. So these were the little things that I, and then a very, then you have to be, you, you, you have to keep yourself happy. I found one activity that is open your old albums. You really feel happy, the time passes quickly, and then one keeps wondering, oh, a few years ago in medical school, we were like this, 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 that. Now coming to the third part of your question, that collaboration of cardiologists and psychologists, I've been a firm believer in that. Before I go to that, I would like to add the last point that it should be your firm faith in God that is going to pull you through this crisis. And uh, remembering my days at Travel Pindi Medical College where I established the Department of Cardiology, I always worked in close liaison with the Department of Psychiatry and especially for women. You know, this uh, problem of palpitation, heart sinking and all that, very often these <clears throat> women were labeled as functional or, you know, they are supracortical, they are pretending, they would go to psychiatry ward, then the professor would decide to give them a shock and before, oh, send them to Professor Nusrat, because before shock therapy, you need to evaluate cardiovascular system. And then I would do an ECG and echo. And this is how, you know, for the first time, I started talking about uh, ischemic heart in younger women also. So I think it is very important because body and soul, mind and heart, they work uh, side by side. And I think we, the lady cardiologists, have a great role not only to solve the psychological problems of women patients, but also men. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Um, we have a question for Dr. Amber Ashraf. 
so the question we have for you is again related to this lockdown. Uh, how can physical activity be maintained during this lockdown to achieve a better cardiovascular risk factor profile uh, for primary prevention and secondary prevention for anyone who has cardiovascular disease, especially women? Thank you very much for asking me a question during these days of lockdown. Before answering it, I really want to thank Dr. Khalda Sungo, Professor Harun, Dr. Ishtiaq, and organizing such a nice webinar on cardiovascular diseases, COVID-19, especially in women. And really thankful for the guest speakers, as well as a very nice answers from all of you, especially Professor Nusrat, Dr. Khalda, and Amber Malik. They have highlighted so many things in very nicely. It's really a very interesting topic, how one can maintain a physical activity during this era of lockdown, 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 and lockdown. So as we all know, the cardiovascular uh, modifiable risk factors, uh, they can be controlled with a lifestyle modification. And the main pillar is a physical activity. At least a 30 minute of physical activity for five days a week is the foundation and with the help of this we can modify the cardiovascular risk factors how one can achieve this activity during these days so we must have to set and define some goals we must have have our daily routines as dr nusrat highlighted it discipline ourselves set some timetables as well as to make a to-do list Meanwhile, planning for daily exercises. Everybody is saying it's a lockdown where we should go and do an exercise. We can do inside as well as outdoor exercises. Inside exercises, as we all know, the skipping, the yoga, aerobic exercises, especially for the females, those who practice to do it well and good. If not, they start trying it. Outside exercises, uh, we can do it if we have a lot of space at our home. If not, we can go outside in the park, but what is important to wear a proper mask as well as to keep a social distance. That is very important with the help of which we can have our daily physical activities at least 30 minutes spare for ourselves in order to prevent the further disease progression. So, in this way, we can look after our uh, healthy lifestyle and health. While as a female, we are doing our everyday household activities, we can uh, organize it in such a way that we can involve physical activities more. Like, just see a simple TV remote. It's better to go and switch on and off the TV by yourself. Use these gadgets in physical ways so that you can improve your physical activities. Along with this, you can define new hobbies for yourself. Just like a gardening, you can have cooking, any other music, dancing, swimming, anything which you can, especially while you define new activities, hobbies, during these days, it will help not only your physical health as well as it can relax you it can relieve your stresses like if simply you are doing a gardening you can do a physical activity with the help of this you can modify your life and look after the risk factors as well meanwhile eat healthy drink plenty of water do a regular exercise and the good thing is ramazan in this ramazan we can uh, make more time for our Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we offer our prayers and 20 tarawi. We can do a very nice physical activity during this time. So we can spend the time with our family members, make them happy along with uh, combined physical activities, combined exercises. This is an opportunity. We should take this opportunity in such a nice way 
कि वे स्माइल जस्ट लाइक हनाना इज स्माइलिंग एंड इट कैन गिव अ नाइस हेल्थी रिलैक्स एनवायरमेंट एंड वी कैन हेल्प अवर एल्डरलीज द सिक एंड अ लोन एंड वी कैन मोटिवेट दैम टू कम एंड डू अ फिजिकल एक्टिविटीज एंड एक्सरसाइजेस इन दिस वे all the modifiable risk factors like diabetes hypertension obesity everything we can look after because uh, physical inactivity is just like smoking so the best thing is we should motivate ourselves all of us and we do these exercises and we can utilize our knowledge and skills not only to improve our mental health physical health as well as we can uh put energy to our family members they should do the physical activities the friends and we look after our patients and guide them as well thank you very much anana for asking this question and a uh, wonderful type of answers were already given by all the senior professors and the faculty thank you very much thank you dr amber and thank you to all our exceptional coaches uh we would now like to move on to the questions from the audience and dr sanu faja would moderate that so thank you everyone thank you everyone uh, am i audible and clear yes and dr sanu very loud and clear all right thank you very much for this for a prompt comment and it was really an excellent session before going and moving to the question and session i would like uh, to answer one query which was uh, raised by dr amber malik uh, dr amber uh, i have been working in an icvd uh, in the er and uh, an icvd is the uh, uh, is the leading tertiary care hospital uh, for the cardiac facilities and especially intervention and we have been doing the highest number of uh, primary pcis so in this uh, covid pandemic what we have noticed from our data that around 40% decline in uh, the primary pcis so you were very right that about uh, one third decline in the primary pcis uh, in general so now we move to the questions from the audience we have uh, uh, dr solis pathi with us and uh, he would like to ask a question uh, from our speaker so i would uh, uh, do we have dr solat fatmi uh dr uh, uh, sanam can you help he has asked the question in the chat so maybe all we right, can get it right. all right if he's around i would like that uh, he can ask by himself or i can ask on his behalf all right so let me uh, let me ask the question dr kolas has uh, asked the question that as we know that uh, uh, we have the patient who already have been uh, went for the cabbage uh, in the past and uh, because of this uh, covid 19 they are on risk of uh, uh, having the thrombosis so what do you think that uh, should we keep those patients on the dpt until this pandemic is over uh we can't hear who who would you like to answer that question Annabel why don't you take a stab at it Okay thank you so much Um so the the answer to that question is unknown because there aren't any studies so I think that people will have to just uh, take their um uh, use their own clinical judgment um we know that there is a higher risk of thromboembolic disease in in um covid-19 so if patients have covid-19 and they had a recent stent or they had a recent mi i think that um 
people will just have to treat individual patients um, with their clinical judgment. I know that my colleagues at Rush have been struggling with all the uh, venothrombotic embolic disease that they're seeing in the cardiac patients, and some of them are being put on anticoagulants in addition to the dual antiplatelet uh, drugs. So I think that people will have to um, just use their own judgment until we have more answers. I hope that helps. Maybe Dr. Mehta has another um, suggestion also. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Nappi. And uh, the next question uh, was from the audience was about the anti malarials uh, And there was a question on the chat box that they were asking that, uh, what about anti malarials Because we have a, a contradictory data, uh, some are supporting for the prophylactic use and, uh, uh, for, uh, and for treatment. Whereas some uh, other data is declining about the use of it. What do you think that what uh, uh, the data we have from now, what would be our strategy for the use of anti malaria in this kind of COVID-19? I can take a stab at that. Um, so actually, there is no robust evidence for the use of um, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine for prophylaxis. So if it is taken, it's best to be taken in the framework of a trial. Um, so you can contribute to development of more evidence in that area. Um, but as such, there's no, uh, there's no concrete robust evidence um, for the use of these agents for uh, prophylaxis. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Napoli. Uh, we have Dr. Suwey Khan with us, and uh, he would like to ask his question. I request Pastor that he can unmute him so he can ask the question for you. Yes, yes, Dr. Suwey, you can speak. Can you guys hear Dr. me? Yes. Yeah, this is this is Dr. Suhail. I'm based in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, it's, it's a great uh, conference. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Shahab and the team for putting this together. Um, I'm just going to piggyback on what Dr. Uh, Samad was saying earlier. Um, and, you know, just an example, I had a patient um, a week ago, uh, one of my physician friend, his mom, she was 82 year old and uh, she started having severe headache in the morning, called the EMS 911. They came in and they're like, well, you know, you are 82 years old, you have some headache and did this COVID thing going on, so why don't you stay at home and rest a little bit? And then I was called about six hours later, I talked to her on the telly, and turn out uh, she had a huge stroke and intracranial bleed. <clears throat> so we are already seeing this uh, downward tre trend in, in acute MIs and you know stroke. And I'm really worried when the second wave hit, without vaccination, I'm, I'm worried once uh, the winter or the fall come across, we will see a, a, large, a large trend of that. Is the AHA doing anything in terms of uh, you know, public awareness, how to address this issue? Because COVID-19 at worst, for example, if you look at the Italian data, at worst, the mortality is about you know, four to 5%, or maybe it's one to 2% in, in the US or other countries. But if you have a major MI, uh, the, the mortality can be as high as 100%. And we already know that women may not present with, with typical symptom, they tend to stay home. Uh, so what is AHA doing in terms of addressing that issue? And the second question would be about the big elephant in the room that we never talk about is, is the social determiners of health. And now we are seeing in the US that the COVID-19 is affecting uh, minorities, African-American and Latino. There's a very high, high mortality in that group. And, and then, you know, I, as, uh, you know it's, I, I hate to say that, but I also take women and then that minority because of the access to care and uh, the atypical presentation of cardiovascular disease. And, and I'm just curious that whether that's something uh, that AHH is looking at to address the issue. Thank you. Thank you. I, this is Dr. Volgman. I'll take a stab at that um, comment. 
So on behalf of the American Heart Association, which Dr. Lakshmi Mehta and I are representing, we, um, the AHA, the American Heart Association has actually put out some public service announcements um, speaking about going to the, to the calling 911 if you're having a stroke or a heart attack. As I showed in my slides, that that's one of the public service announcements that they're doing. Um, of course, we need to do more. Our hospitals and our local governments need to also um, do more to um, take out the fear of people to call 911, which they have done. Um, it's, it's a, you know, everyone has to, to join in in the efforts. It's not going to be just the American Heart Association, but everyone needs to inform their patients not to worry about contracting COVID um, when they're having a heart attack or stroke because that's what's going to kill them more than the COVID. Um, the other thing that you um, alluded to is the racial and ethnic minority having more um, uh, infections and mortality from this. And uh, of course, um, we're all very concerned about that. Um, the AHA has actually um, given um, a, a request for propo proposals for um, a research studies, and they have just granted $2.5 million. And most of the studies that were funded um, touch upon the racial um, differences, the ethnic differences in the mortality in this disease. So um, the AHA, of course, is doing their part, but um, I think we all should be doing our part in um, making sure that we inform our patients about the importance of social distancing and the um, things that uh, we are being told to do. Unfortunately, people who um, in certain socioeconomic um, status um, can't do social distancing as, as well as some um, more affluent people can. So, you know, I think the public health officials have to address those issues. So I hope that answers your question. Additionally, additionally, the AHA on their website um, has lots of information, both for patients, um, so the lay community, as well as professionals. Um, we've released a podcast series for uh, patients to listen to, especially we've done one on women and heart disease, one on pregnancy and COVID-19 as well. Um, so those resources are available out there for uh, the patients as well as uh, professionals. And the research definitely is there. And so you can go onto the website and uh, learn more about all of those. So just a quick uh, uh, question, uh, Dr. Lakshmi, uh, if you can please answer so we can uh, move to close this uh, uh, session of question and answer. Uh, Iban, I just want to ask that, uh, uh, what do you think about the ARBs and AT inhibitors? Should we stop them and what is the data? Um, Lakshmi, do you want me to answer this since I presented the data on this? Sure, you can. Um, I'm sure you, you have your opinions as well, but um, the data has actually shown that it, well, first of all, I want to make sure that everyone knows that the, um, all of the uh, cardiac societies in the United States, as well as Europe, um, have um, recommended not stopping the ACE inhibitors and ARBs. And it is proving to be uh, beneficial in some patients that um, was shown in, in uh, the China study. The New York study um, did not show mortality benefit um, and um, the meta-analysis studies have not shown mortality benefit, but um, it is very important for, for us to advise our patients not to stop their ACE inhibitors or ARBs or other um, RAS medications uh, for fear of um, getting worse outcomes, but the data is um, needs to be um, completed, but uh, the societies have been recommending not to stop those ARBs and ACE inhibitors. Thank you. All right, uh, we have Dr. Usha with us. Uh, Dr. Usha wanted to ask a question from you, Dr. Nabi. And if uh, Dr. Usha, you can, uh, Bhatik, uh, can you unmute Dr. Usha? Hi, Annabelle. Hi, everyone. Hi, hello, Dr. Hi, 
Yeah, thank you for uh, taking my question. Uh, two, two things. One is an observation. Uh, this is uh, what Annabelle had talked about, uh, the male-female ratio in, in Pakistan. So what we're seeing in India is uh, across the country, um, you know, more men are infected than women, more men are dying than women. But uh, just yesterday, there was a, a report saying that inner city women, especially the urban poor women, uh, seem to be having a higher mortality as well, which may circle back to the whole social determinants of health issue that was brought up. So that is just an observation. My question is to Annabelle. Uh, have, has she seen any difference in women who take hormone replacement therapy uh, and in, in terms of um, uh, outcomes of COVID-19? And, uh, and also, you know, the postmenopausal versus pre-menopausal women. Thank you. Thank you so much, Usha. It's great to see you all the way from India. Um, so I, I actually, we are also seeing in the urban Chicago area the same thing, that the urban women of Chicago are not um, get, having less mortality. So um, our data is uh, still being compiled and being analyzed, but I, we are about to publish something about that. Um, so very interesting observations from, um, from India. Um, in terms of hormone replacement therapy, it's a great question, and I'm sure you know the answer to that. We don't have enough data. Um, we don't have any data, actually, but I think that's a great question, and that's something that uh, maybe we should look into, and maybe we could do, do a registry um, for women who have COVID. And, and I, the American Heart Association is actually doing a registry um, for COVID-19 uh, patients, and that would be a great question to ask that registry. Thank you for that question. All right, thank you, Dr. Nabi. Uh, last question uh, with, uh, from Dr. Harun Baba, and uh, then we will be moving to a closed session and uh, a bit of a time. So uh, do we have Dr. Harun Baba with us? We would just move to ask. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak and make a few comments. What we are seeing this COVID crisis is uh, the time has passed is around more than six months since we are in this uh, COVID-19 that women with acute coronary syndrome or an MI, they are more vulnerable and the prognosis is more poor than as compared to their male colleagues. So what I want to say is that we should be more prepared now since six months have passed. Rather than being afraid of this COVID-19, of course, we have to take all the precautions with PPEs. All our centers should be prepared to deal and take up primary PCIs as well as other emergency measures when the patient comes to you or to the hospital or to the emergency with ACS. So I would like to ask that has the world of cardiology in the West or even in the East have they done some concrete steps in this way, in this path, or still we are struggling to create a better platform? Dr. Lakshmi? Yeah, I mean, if the question is pertaining to the care of COVID-19 patients in the last six months, I would say, you, you know, every country is going through it at different rates and every country is so different in 
the types of patients that are acquiring it as Dr. Uh, Voldman had shown previously on her slide. So I think that yes, six months has gone and we've learned a lot, but there's so much more to learn in terms of the treatment of these patients. And that's where partnerships with societies like the American Heart Association, Pakistan Cardiac Society, to cars cross collaborate across the globe so we can get a better understanding. Yes, there's fears, but many of those fears is also based on the media. Um, and, and the lack of PPE. So as societal organizations, we are working to you know, pass out the public service announcements and which we're happy to share the AHA's um, uh, public service announcements also with the Pakistan Cardiac Society. But it's, it's important to share the messages with the community so that people are aware and people to Would make- Would you like to make any comment on this? I'm sorry. Thank you, Dr. Lakshmi. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Anita, would you like to uh, put, any, uh, put any comments on it? Dr. Anita, please unmute yourself. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Just want to add that. Uh, it's great that we are seeing the falling number in some countries and even in the admission that we had in Iran. So some good points we are seeing, although many things still is unknown, but however, the, we are seeing the falling in number of cases that are, are admitted in the hospitals, even maybe to one third. However, the second wave, we are not, we are worried about that. But the good point is now we are seeing the falling numbers. And again, the semi-elective cases are going to be admitted. So the, something is we, we can see in China and Iran, and even in some places in the US, there are falling a number of the cases, but it depends on the countries and the locations. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anita. And we would now uh, compile this uh, uh, question and answer session. I just want, would like to make a final comment that a woman is very important uh, part of the society. And it is said that if you educate a woman, you educate the society. So why we uh, this forum uh, on this forum, especially uh, from the from the Guru at uh, Women Forum, why it's important to to, uh, to educate a woman about the prevention about uh, the impact of uh, the COVID-19 on the cardiovascular and the psychological illness. Why it's important because if you educate the women, uh, you will educate the society and the generation. So I, I wish and I hope that all the women and all the males who are here with us today should at least educate whatever we have learned today uh, at least 10%. So if we are 300 or 400 people over here and you will give the message to 10 people so we can understand how much love we have communicated and get out of today's people. Uh, thank you very much everyone for your valuable time and thank you very much to all the speakers, Dr. Anita, Dr. Lashmi and Dr. Nafi. Uh, for the vote of thanks, I would like to call upon CEO, the Perosin Pharmaceutical. Uh, to to come upon and uh, 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 say the vote of thanks to our honourable speakers and our chairs and coaches. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sanam. Uh, this is Osman Wahid, I'm the CEO of the Rosans. It's a it's a unique privilege for us to be uh, sponsoring, supporting this really high powered uh, uh, session of extremely competent uh, female cardiologists. As we've seen in this COVID crisis, women leaders across the world have really shown the rest of the planet how these crises have to be managed. And we salute all of you in the front lines who risk your lives, yourselves, every day to support uh, uh, your patients in this incredible time of need uh, facing a terrible pandemic. Uh, I'd like to especially thank our three speakers for today, Dr. Annabel, Dr. Anita, uh, Dr. Lakshmi Mehta, uh, of course, the co-chairs of this evening, Professor Khalda Sumro, uh, Dr. Sanya Nishtar, who are, because of some technical issues, unfortunately, was not able to join on, uh, Professor Zainab Samad, Professor Ambar Ashraf, Professor Ambar Malik, and Professor Nusrat Ara Majid. And of course, the moderator, Dr. Hunaina Shahab, and 
Dr. Sanam Khwaja. Uh, thank you all so very much. Uh, we are, uh, we pledge to support uh, you in this time of need in any way we can. Uh, and we hope that together we can overcome this pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Have uh, a very nice day and uh, we wish uh, uh, very healthy and safe lives for everyone. Thank you once again. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank you, Alafis. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Alafis.